you know, what about resistance mm. by the existing entities? By the way, that to me is what makes Emmanuel Daniel uh, very valuable. What I've found in all ranges of, of public policy, people, the more people become expert in and familiar with an existing system, the more they tend to resist change because this is what they know and what they're good at and what they make their money at. And I started my association with Emmanuel when he was asking me to go and talk to the very conventional existing banking institutions, but at the same time, he was talking about where, where we go. I've always said one of the great things they say about a, a politician, oh, he never forgot where he came from. And my response is, okay, but I don't want to be so happy with where he came from that he doesn't know where we should go next. And that's what Emmanuel emerges. Here's this, this problem on the competitive side. The banks will be worried because it's one of the things we talked about at breakfast. It will be logical for some of the entities that are engaged in crypto, digital, et cetera, to want to branch out. And one of the things you will hear banks arguing is nobody should be able to get into our business who is not subject to exactly the same constraints and regulations that we are. So I want to get kind of manual into the discussion here mm -hmm. in this book that really struck me as being really, really important and, and why I encourage you all to, to, to read the, get the book, which you will, and then, and then read it. There are two things in particular that really stood out for me. One is you notice that the subtitle of the book is called The Personalization of Finances Here. And I, I am afraid that a lot of people in the industry will look at that and think of personalization in its current kind of form, which is personalizing offers, personalizing messages. And I don't think that's what. When I had gone through my litany before about the neobanks and the three reasons why they had started up, and I said number one was you know, the, the digital experience and number two being dissatisfaction. It's really the third part that was the most important and I think the most sustainable. It was the challenger banks or neo banks like, uh, like Aspiration, uh, started by Andre Cherney, or a Panacea Financial, which serves young physicians who don't just start a neobank because it's a digital bank. They start it because they have a vision of serving a particular affinity group with products and services that meet the specific needs of that segment. And I think when, Emmanuel, when you reference personalization here in your book, you're not talking about marketing personalization, you're talking about product and, and service personalization that we don't have today, not, not just because people weren't envisioning it, but to a large extent because today's predominant technology capabilities don't enable it. For all the talk about mass customization, we don't have that in banking today. It, it's not possible to do that, but with uh, you know, more Web3 type tools, with more um, utilization of the blockchain, this, this becomes, uh, you know, very much more uh, fe feasible. So I'd love for you to talk about that. And the second thing that really struck me in the book was the section on the financialization of everything. And I, it gets, strikes me when I read that uh, section manual that um, there are going to be folks who say, wait, we've financialized a lot of stuff already, and isn't that the reason we have all these problems in the first place? So I'm going to turn the mic over to you and ask you to kind of maybe we'll talk about whatever you want, of course, but would love it if you'd address the personalization and financialization points. Uh, in this book, uh, will blow the mind of a lot of people, and, um, you know, it, it sort of um, makes people want to stand back and say, okay, uh, what exactly are we looking at? I start by envisioning uh, where technology is taking us today. And so I start by saying that we are now properly in a trans transition from uh, the platform era to personalization. That, that transition has started. Um, and then in the middle of the book, I actually struggle with a number uh, from platforms to personalization. Uh, I, I suggest and I, I argue uh, that the platform players, uh, their days are numbered. Uh, I still remembered uh, when uh, Facebook tried to make that transition from desktop 
to mobile, and it almost failed. Uh, and this was in between the year 2007, when Facebook first started, to 2010. Uh, by 2010, the world had effectively moved to mobile, but Facebook didn't think that it was necessary or couldn't find the interfaces that made it work. In fact, it was the Chinese players uh, that aced that part of the game. And that is why you saw the rise of uh, uh, Alipay and, and, and WeChat uh, becoming natural players in, in, the, in the mobile phase uh, of the platform era. So today, this year, is the, year, is the first year that Facebook's uh, numbers have officially started falling. Uh, and they are in attrition at the moment. Uh, and they are in attrition to players like TikTok. Uh, and when you look at what TikTok is, it's also a bit player that uh, will find it difficult to uh, onboard uh, three-dimensional experiences, um, you know, virtual reality and so on. So um, we should not... Um, you know, fall in love with uh, any face um, uh, when it is dominating and think that it's going to dominate for a long time. We remember Blackberries and then into, um, into uh, Apple and, and Blackberry was going to last forever. I mean, the business community was, was uh, you know, was uh, embedded into it. Um, so the, the thing about that transition is that today, um, users are claiming more power uh, into the ownership of the data, the use of the data, and many new different things. It can be blockchain, it can be um, um, NFTs, uh, and so on. Uh, they are actually uh, enabling uh, users to decide who they want to interact with uh, and how and why. Now, I start the book with the photograph of uh, an ice cube, and that is to make the book easy uh, for people from outside of the finance industry to understand. Remember, there was a time when ice was something that you uh, sawed out of the lakes of Boston and brought it out to New York on, on a horse carriage uh, and see how much, of the, how much of it was wasted and so on. And finance is something like that today. In fact, when you think about uh, foreign exchange and it goes around the world and swishes around before it reaches you uh, and you have inflation, bank charges, security and all of these features, uh, how inefficient money is. And then when you see what happened to ice, uh, is that it's something today that we produce uh, in the refrigerator at home. That's personalization. And what made that possible? It was a chemical called CFC, chlorofluorocarbon, uh, that absorbed heat and enabled water to freeze. Uh, and so this book is a lot about what is the, um, the CFC of finance? What, what is it that will make finance personalized uh, and put it in the hand and the control of the individual? And that is why what Ron said about personalization and how banks understand personalization today uh, is, is a challenge for me to overcome as well, which is we're not talking supply-side personalization. It, we're not saying that uh, what the customer wants is more of your products. Uh, we're talking about personalization that moves the needle and the relationship and the power of the relationship more into the hands of the user uh, and the user community. Uh, and uh, in that aspect, I struggle with um, uh, several um, concepts, uh, such as payments, for example. Uh, payments as an, an ability to capture value and to transmit value. I, I go through um, many of the issues that um, current financial institutions uh, do not perhaps appreciate enough uh, about the revolution that is coming through. I'm also saying that whenever uh, financial services or any industry for that matter makes that transition, you will always find problems of integrity. Uh, and, and, and this transition is going to happen again going forward. Um, if you treat cryptocurrencies as a um, as a um, um, as a uh, as a security, uh, then it falls. It, 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 all of the elements of securities trading uh, are applicable to it, uh, and there's no magic about that. But then something else is happening in in cryptocurrency, 
Francis, which is that the networked world is being formed right now. It's not fully formed, uh, and the people forming them are not necessarily people of integrity, uh, as we've seen recently, uh, but uh, it's taking shape. Uh, NFTs um, and, um, and, you know, when you think about NFTs and gaming tokens, for example, uh, it's interesting that we now live in a world uh, where uh, people are willing to uh, give valuations uh, to um, ephemeral products. Uh, and in fact, that's where I want to say something about uh, the uh, financialization of everything. Now, we are now in, in a realm where there, is, there are more such companies uh, producing data. Uh, the, um, for example, Tesla says it's got 10 billion um, you know, uh, sets of data or something like that uh, in the cars that it manufactures. Now, with, uh, with so much data being produced, uh, they lend themselves to being financialized um, and then uh, to be traded. Now, what eventually becomes financialized, it's not clear yet. So now the thing is this, in taming data and the amount of data that is going to be produced, uh, a lot of data will be unusable. In fact, I called, uh, I know that you, you've heard that data is oil, I call data vegetable. You have too much, it's unusable. You have too little, you, it's unusable. If data that is kept for too long, it's unusable. Data that's too short, it's un unusable. So it's got a, a value that is perishable. Uh, you know, and, and we, we will go through the process of identifying uh, what about data uh, is usable. The thesis of this book, um, it's a thinking man's thesis. It's not a, uh, you know, I, I didn't write a book with all the answers. Uh, in fact, if you read the book and uh, it, you, it generated more ideas, uh, you know, then I think that it, it serves its purpose. There are a few things that I'm saying from this book. For example, um, I'm able to say that financial inclusion is a lie. Uh, financial inclusion as driven by uh, the platform economy, when you think about it, what is it that the platform players want to do? They want to get thousands, if not millions, of poor people on board and then monetize them because um, it's the venture capitalists who are waiting on the other side of the equation uh, to profit from, uh, from onboarding uh, millions of uh, people, you know, whether they are in large countries or um, you know, large segments of population that have not been financialized yet. Uh, so I'm able to say that uh, very clearly in, in, in this book. I'm also able to say things like the blockchain revolution and the central bank digital currency revolution um, that's not actually happening in finance. Uh, central bank digital currencies, for example, uh, when you see the talent pool and the issues that a central bank digital currency faces uh, and put that alongside the talent pool uh, and the energy that is available in, in the, or rather that's underway in the uh, crypto world, um, central bank digital currencies just cannot match uh, the, the talent pool there is uh, in central, in, in crypto. In crypto. Uh, and so, um, you know, um, so I make assertions such as um, stable coins might well be, um, you know, uh, a very uh, viable uh, proposition going forward, uh, and that if it's regulated, um, then it becomes uh, a working mechanism and so on. Uh, so I'm saying many, many things. Now, what am I not saying? I'm not saying that uh, this is the end of institutions. I'm not saying that this is the end of intermediation also, and this is a discussion I've had with, uh, uh, with Barney and with Ron at, at different points. Uh, how these will work out uh, remains be, to be seen, uh, but I think that you know, we should leave that for um, a few more factors to come together to see how that works. But for example, I'm saying in the book that, um, that Adam Smith said that uh, intermediation was too expensive and that the best way to run a business was to be, well, for businesses to be run by the small business owner, not by large corporations. But within 300 years, it was the large corporations that dominated business. Uh, and another economist, uh, I, I, um, uh, uh, 
uh, I forget his name now, um, but he suggested that the reason uh, large corporations dominated was because in that 300 years, um, it was difficult for the small business owner to have access to data. He doesn't have access to uh, all the data required for him to be able to uh, make the decisions required for things like uh, in salaries to workers, uh, what to charge for services and so on. And today, uh, with more data being uh, made available uh, to all parties involved in a transaction, that reduces the need for large businesses. But instead, it's created platforms. Uh, and, and if that disintegrates, then we will have to see how that will evolve. Okay, 